Give a little bit of your time, girl Cause that's all that I really need Just to see you smile in the morning And to feel your body next to me Oh, give a little more Just a little more time Give a little bit of your love, girl Cause that's all that I'm asking for Just to feel your little heartbeat beating And to feel you closer than before oh, Give a little more Just a little more time Tell me that you're not gonna leave Cause you're the only According to the United States Department of Transportation, 32 people die in drunk driving crashes every day. That's about one person every 45 minutes. In 2020, 11,654 people died in alcohol-impaired driving traffic deaths, which is a 14% increase from 2019. All of these are preventable. Now I want people to listen to this because... Many think that a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08 or less is legal, and it is. I should be fine. Well, in 2020, there were 2,041 people killed in alcohol-related crashes where a driver had a blood alcohol concentration of 0.01 to 0.07. Now, some may think that this means I can't go to bars, I can't go to parties, or even work-related events. Not true. We have systems in place today where this can allow you to have fun and also prevent these horrible, deadly accidents. I will admit, as I tell my story, to hopefully help others that I have driven highly intoxicated many times. I've actually had to drive holding one eye just to be able to see straight. Luckily, I've never been in an accident while doing that. This does show me, and hopefully everybody else, why it's so important for me to stay clean and sober. Now, if you're going to an event and you plan on drinking, plan to get a ride home. We got Uber, we've got Lyft, we've got taxis that can take you home. Plan, because once you start drinking, the first thing to go, and it doesn't take a lot of alcohol, is your thinking and your reasoning. Now, you can tell yourself that you're fine, but it won't take long before your muscle coordination and your balance begins to go. About 30% of all traffic crash fatalities in the United States involves drunk drivers with blood alcohol concentrations of 0.08 or higher. Now, if someone you know has been drinking, do not let that person get behind the wheel. Take their keys and help them arrange a sober ride home. If you're hosting a party where alcohol is going to be served, make sure all your guests leave with a sober driver. Always wear your seatbelts. It's probably your best defense against impaired drivers. If you see an impaired driver on the road, contact local law enforcement because your actions could help save someone's life. Our guest today was an upcoming movie star whose dreams and life was nearly taken by a drunk driver. Please stay tuned because his story is important to hear. We'll be right back. You don't want to miss it. Bye. 
Hey, welcome back to High Wall Clean, and this is Eric McCoy. You know, we got a show today that I believe is going to show all of us that we can do anything if we're willing to fight for it. His name is Cesar Perez. He was an upcoming star in the entertainment industry. After graduating from Georgia Southern University in 2015, where he studied multimedia communications and music performance, his determination brought him various contract work as the lead graphic designer for several feature films. And it wasn't long before he was cast as Pablo in a lead role starring opposite of Daniel Radcliffe in The Beast of Burden. Also did graphic design work for that film. And fairly quickly, following the completion of Beast of Burden, Caesar was cast as another lead character, Javier, in Blind Trust. That was in 2017. His dreams would soon become a nightmare in January of 2018 when a drunk driver slammed into his car head on. Now, to create an even scarier image in your mind, after getting hit by the drunk driver, he was spun 180 degrees toward oncoming traffic and a big rig hit him and dragged him for a bit and basically leaving him encased in a pile of twisted metal. A severe brain injury had left him almost entirely incapacitated. His right arm was paralyzed. His femur had snapped in two. His face was shattered. He spent months learning how to breathe, eat, walk, and talk all over again. And then, on top of it all, his girlfriend. And I haven't had an opportunity to read the entire book, but I did look at quite a bit of it. His girlfriend, he was determined, was the woman of his dreams, left. I came across his story, and I was personally inspired to reach out to him for a couple of reasons, and one of them being that the show is about recovery and recovery from substance abuse and to remind everybody that your choices and the decisions that you make could be devastating, such as what happened to Caesar. And the second reason is that I love stories of survival. Oh, yeah, I didn't even mention, (laughs) as I'm getting pretty excited about this, that uh, I'm going to give you a real quick biography uh, about him. Cesar Perez is a Salvadorian immigrant who spent every day of a second chance at life striving to be the best possible version of himself. He is a passionate storyteller. And this is what he did with his pain. He picked up the pieces of his broken past, his broken heart, and he bound them together into love, persistence, and determination. He is an author of a book titled Chase the Light, The Gruesome Art of Becoming Unbreakable, as he has a new passion to guide others through the darkness. Now, there was a new excitement that I didn't know until I received the media kit, and I started looking through his book which was how similar the lessons he gained from his experiences and the lessons I gained through my pain in life. Now, my story included many forms of head trauma, including uh, having a seizure on the top bunk in jail and landing on my head and cracking my skull. But I want to tell you, Caesar definitely took it to a new level. The last chapter of his book has lines in bold. And for anybody who knows me, has been in any of my lectures or sat through any of my classes. I want to mention a couple. I don't want to give too much away, but I have to mention this. One of them, stop caring about what others think of you. Now, I don't say it quite as clean. My words are, let's stop giving a fuck what people think about us. (laughs) But as Caesar put it, the best version of ourselves. The second is... Realize what happened is in the past and that acceptance is key. Now, I talk about 
not being able to change the past. The past is gone. The future is nothing but expectations, and all you have is now. Acceptance is the precondition to change, and so that the only way we can ever improve is that we first need to accept it. Stop finding change right now. Now, I want to read a quote directly from the email that I received because it can't be said any better. But life, ultimately, is a gift. Fragile, firm, and beautiful. Throughout the course of Caesar's long, often torturous recovery, Chase the Light shines with courage, grace, and the resilience of the human spirit, reminding us that every life has meaning and every soul has a purpose always, even in the darkest moments. Caesar, I want to thank you so much for coming on our show. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, and I want to tell you that I was uncertain if I would actually get a response because, and I sort of put this in there myself and many of our listeners of this show have had substance abuse issues and many of us have driven intoxicated and it could easily have been any of us. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very excited to learn from you. I also hope that I can guide you a little today, too. Absolutely. I am a counselor and I'm a teacher, but most importantly, I'm a student. And, uh, and I do want to forewarn you, like I had said, I'm not great at sticking to a specific outline, um, but I'll try my best. <laughs> no worries. So I, uh, I want to say I'm very impressed with you. And how, how old are you? Currently, uh, right now, I'm 29. Wow. And so that accident happened when I was 24, and I got discharged two days before my 25th birthday from the hospital. Wow. Yeah, and I, you know, looking at those photos, terrifying. Terrifying. And, you know, to, to see something like that, you know, one thing I find, and again, with my listeners and everybody out there, when we become the best versions of ourselves, like you had mentioned, that so many people think of substance abusers as bad people, horrible people, things like that, right? But I have yet to ever find somebody that becomes the best version of themselves that's not a great person. And so, again, I thank you for really doing this. I appreciate it. No, it was my pleasure. <laughs> I want to ask you really quick, on, and of course, going to, um, and I know that wasn't her name, but Heather. <laughs> mm -hmm. That had to have just been horrible. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely like two trucks hitting me again, you know, because um, my life was simmering down. My anger and the pain I was feeling was kind of simmering down. And then just watching that in my brain, you know, at the time I still had the brain injury, uh, watching that last piece of my life before the accident, you know, kind of break off was literally how much more can a man take, you know, how much can a heart take? And so uh, it just broke me down further. And again, it was like two trucks hitting me all over again. It was like I had hit the reset button again, you know, with all the progress I had made mentally, emotionally, it was like I had to start over. You kind of gave that clue in in sort of the, you know, towards the beginning of the book, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. And when I caught that and I saw the idea that she was all about outward. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you being broken, I, I, I instantly kind of figured that part out <laughs> that where that was going to lead. Yeah, it, it was it was harder for me to figure out, you know, going on along just because uh my brain it, it just it was just focused on her you know because a severe brain injury for a lot of people it's different but for me it was like it kept replaying the same thing over and over like I was on my way to see her that night so she became my world literally everything so I would have done anything for her and that's how severe my brain injury was like I would have jumped off a bridge if that made her happy you know like that's how bad it was uh, but slowly as my brain kept healing then I could start seeing what everybody else was seeing you know what everybody else had seen but Again, they weren't going to tell me because I was already as broken as could be. So it was interesting. Your, I mean, your rise to fame, mm -hmm. hitting those big movies. And then right after that, you get into that accident. You were headed to her house. What do you remember? I remember everything from before the accident up until when I saw the vehicle in front of me veer drastically right. 
And then I just saw flashing lights and then that's it. And you were in a coma? Uh, I'm assuming I was, I got put in the coma. So I was in an induced coma for a few days while obviously they were trying to make do surgery, trying to stabilize me. Uh, but I don't remember. I know I was conscious because there are videos of me uh, moving and there's, there are, when I went to the first responders to thank them personally, they said that I was uh, spitting my teeth out and I was fighting them off, you know, when they came to rescue me. So I know I, I was conscious. I just don't remember it. You know, the most beautiful part about it all was your family. Yeah. And this is the thing that what really sucks for some people. Mm -hmm. I think the support, I can almost guarantee that if you didn't have that, you might not have made it. That support was so vital in my recovery. I like to think that no matter what, just because of my who I was, how I was raised by my family, again, because they raised me and all the values I had instilled, they were instilled in me. Like I would have made it out somewhere or another, but having them there just helped me so much more and helped me recover quickly. Um, I don't know how long it would have taken if I had been by myself, you know, uh, but it did make a world of difference just having them by me. Were your parents paying money to quote unquote Heather? Yeah. And I didn't find that out until after the hospital, when I sat down with my mom and talked afterwards, um, she was, she said that she was giving my sisters a hundred dollars each week because they were driving back and forth. And then my sister, my older sister would pick up Heather um, and drive up to the hospital. Uh, and so my mom, she took Heather to the side and told her I would give this to my to my child, me, if he was here, you know, if he was conscious. But since you're a part of him, I want you to have it for any expenses that you coming to see him cost. And I didn't know about this, obviously, until way later. But do you yeah. think your? I mean, did your mom know that it wasn't going to work out with you guys? Oh, they all do. They already had an idea. Um, they just kind of didn't say anything because, again, they, they saw how my uh, like my body was an engine and Heather was my motor. You know, like that's how I can um, phrase it, because she was the reason I kept going. Like I was going to make it out of there for her, for me, for us, you know, because I, I really didn't care about my life at that point, you know, but I was going to make it out for us. And so they saw that she was my motive. So they were like, let's just hopefully she stays. And my sister even told her, oh, well, not told her, but she told my family, I will even pay her to keep coming just because they knew how important she was for me in my recovery at the time. Now you're back, back working again. Yeah, I'm back doing 100% everything. <laughs> yeah, because I saw and I had looked on the IMDb, you know, that there's a new movie. I'd kind of even put on the, I couldn't find a photo of anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're back doing what you love. Yeah. And uh, it, like when we left the hospital, uh, I told my mom that I, well, her and I spoke and I told her that I was going to get back everything. Like I, this was unfair and that I was going to fight to the very end to get what was taken from me. And she was like, I'll be right there beside you every step of the way. And we did it together. You know, people that have near death experiences like you mm -hmm. all of a sudden sometimes see the world differently. How do you see the world today compared to the way you used to see it? Yeah, um, I'll, going off that, like I thought, I don't remember when, you know, because I coded on the paramedics several times, uh, which basically means that I stopped breathing. My heart stopped beating. It had to revive me. Uh, but I don't remember if I saw anything flash before my eyes or anything. But that being said, now I do see the world in a different perspective um, just because I, I do feel unbreakable. Like, um, and I don't mean physically, but I'm saying like nothing really can change me or persuade me away from my goals and like little things before that would sometimes bother or maybe sometimes still do bother most people. You know, like I put this as an example all the time, but let's say parking in front of a store and you can't find the closest parking spot. Right. So and then you get frustrated because you got to park all the way in the back. For me now, I purposely like park all the way in the back because I was so close to not being able to walk again not being able to do anything. So every step I take, every everything I do now just has a brand new meaning. And I have so much more gratitude to be able to do it. Um, just when you're that close to losing, to losing anything, really, then you have a new appreciation for everything. 
um, and a whole new, a whole nother level. And so that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I always say with, with, um, appreciation, you know, appreciation, the strongest outbound form of love, the idea of giving of everything and asking for nothing. Mm -hmm. And so many of us sadly have to lose things Yeah. or we say, Oh, look what I had. And now I don't have it anymore. Um, and I think that is one of the benefits of, you know, pain, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's one of the few things, uh, you know, you can come out across on the other side of things with, uh, with a plus, you know, aside from all the pain and suffering, but it's, it's what you make out of it, you know, like what you do and how you react to every situation. Cause again, I could have gone the opposite direction, you know, like drown my pain and alcohol and that gone, gone elsewhere, you know, gone to a dark place, but uh, thankfully having my family there helped me kind of stay on the straight path and uh, focus on my goals and looking forward to towards tomorrow. Did you ever reach any place of wanting to kill yourself? Yep. And before um, my accident, like, again, I was as healthy as could be. I was in top shape of my life. I, I had everything going for me career wise. Um, and I never I was never an emotional guy. I was never an emotional person. Like if I was angry or upset, I would go work out. If I was feeling emotional, sad, whatever, I would write down music, uh, pick up my guitar, sing something. Um, but at after the accident, like all of that had been taken away from me. Like I could barely walk, you know, I couldn't move my right arm. I couldn't sing because my mouth was wired shut. Uh, so it was, it was so depressing. And then the worst part was waking up and seeing myself for the first time, like a few weeks after the accident happened and not being able to recognize the same, that person in the mirror, you know, that just kind of broke me to a whole nother level. And that's when I thought about suicide and it, it was depressing because the following morning I was, I was brainstorming how I would go about doing it, but I, I would have to ask for someone's help, you know, to do it. Like that's how depressing and how, how like such a low moment it was for me that I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even end it if I wanted to, because my right arm was paralyzed. My mom kept holding my left hand di day and night. Um, I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. So it was, it was even more depressing at that point, you know, um, just realizing that I couldn't even end it which was good. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I, that was God right there. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And then, um, my mom, you know, I talked to her and I told her because she saw me cry every night and I spoke to her what I wanted, what I, not what I wanted to do, but what I was feeling. And she started crying and she was like, I, I, I all I ever asked of God, you know, was to protect you, protect the family. And I, I feel like I've been let down and she started crying. And I realized that she had been broken as well, you know, and her break went a lot deeper just because all her beliefs had been basically shattered at, at that time. And so I realized that I couldn't break down for her, you know, like if I had to continue, it would be for her because um, even though my life felt meaningless at the time, having them there, my whole family just gave my life meaning. And that's the power behind this stuff. I done a lot of, you know, interviews with a lot of different people. I say this all the time to some of these people that it's a good thing you went through that just in the light of that you now have experience and you can reach out and help people. You know, you've got a message to those that are suffering. Somebody has to do it. Right. Yeah. I know yeah, it's yeah. kind of a crazy way to think of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, for me, one, once I got to the step of like accepting or the place of accepting, you know, what had happened um, and just kind of finding that, that peace, I realized that, um, yeah, I don't think, you know, this was meant to happen for any, obviously it wasn't my fault. It was some drunk driver, some idiot who got on the road drunk. Uh, but aside from that, you know, a lot of, not a lot of people, but a few people that were on the road behind me, uh, the day of the accident got in touch with my family and they said that they had kids in the backseat that would have died, you know, a hundred percent if, if they had been hit rather than me. And so I think that maybe, uh, you know, if I help save a life, then it was worth it. If I was the one that was meant to take it, because I could, then, you know, I'm okay with it. Because you're unbreakable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I, I caught when I was first looking at the beginning of the book, when I got to the, you know, the show, the chapters and stuff, mm -hmm. and I got very curious on the chapter where you meet with the drunk driver. Yeah. Now he got seven years, eight years. 
he got sentenced from my understanding um the ruling uh was he was going to serve eight he had already served two at the time of his criminal trial so he was only going to serve six more uh he'll be out pretty soon huh? yeah <laughs> he'll be out soon yeah how do you view that guy today honestly just a, a roadblock or a, a rock in the road you know like something that just I hit, you know, or, well, basically he hit me, but I'm saying like, you know, that was on, on my path and I, it just made me stumble, you know, for obviously for, for almost four years. Uh, but I, I don't, I try not to think about it that much just cause, uh, I'm focused on tomorrow. I'm focused on, you know, living today, focusing for tomorrow. And then everything that happened in the past, like, uh, I vowed to leave behind, you know, all the what ifs, all the, oh man, if I hadn't driven down that day or if, hey, if I hadn't stayed there, if I had stayed at work maybe one one minute longer, you know, if I had stopped by to get gas sooner, it's all those, all those things I've left behind and with it, so have I left him behind, you know, all those bad moments, all that pain, I've, uh, I've healed from it and I've just, I put it aside. I don't really think too much of it. Do you forgive him? I do. I do just cause, and it, it was, it was hard getting to that point, but realizing that I'm alive, you know, all, all he did was kind of just put my, my life on hold. Um, it would have been a lot worse, obviously for my family, if I hadn't made it, um, cause that anger, I don't know what, what would have, what would have happened with them, you know, like how, how do you give that back to somebody? And so for me, uh, once I realized that, hey, uh, I'm alive and I, I still have breath in my lungs, I can still live a fulfilling life despite the trauma and scars, mm -hmm. then I was like, there's no point in holding on to that anger anymore. Yeah, we talk about forgiveness and we don't do it for the other people. You know, forgiveness is something that we should do for ourselves. And mm -hmm. so many people think that like the person has to say they're sorry or, you know, and a lot of times, you know, people don't. Um, but it's just letting go. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not going to carry that baggage anymore. Exactly. And that, that's what it is. Cause I mean, even if they do apologize, right. Who's to say they even mean it. Right. So it's like, it's all, it's all within you. Like if you want to let it go, if you want to live with that anger, uh, you know, then by all means, but for me, the anger served the purpose. Obviously it served as energy and I, I, I pushed it all into my recovery and just pushing myself further and further each day. So I channelized the the anger. But afterwards, I realized that, uh, you know, there was no point in being angry anymore. Like, what was that going to do for me? Yeah. Just focus. Destroy you. That's about it. You know? you know, we get a lot of people that have been sexually abused, you know, sometimes by parents and that kind of stuff. And the sad part is that they continue to hold on that and just use it as excuses yeah you know to to continue to make bad choices um so that's cool uh, it's you know that's that's powerful <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna ask you one of the questions that i i had on the thing was um when did you make that decision to write this book it was my mother's idea she was the one that told me to start writing down everything just because she saw how angry how depressed how emotionally distressed i was uh, she thought it would help me in some way uh, heal internally, which is what I definitely needed. I didn't think much of it. I didn't expect any of it. Um, I just started doing it because I, I could barely do anything else. Uh, so I figured I was a big fitness fanatic. I worked out a lot. Um, I figured the only muscle I could train at the time was my brain. So I started reading and I started writing and it served as a catharsis for me, like putting everything on paper or well, typing it out. Uh, slowly as my brain injury kept healing too, I, I started putting together the pieces of my broken life that was now my puzzle, you know, or of this puzzle that was not my life. And slowly it's, I started feeling that I was healing and the tears stopped flowing after a while. And that's when I realized that there was a message I wanted to get across. So I started editing the book. I started editing the pages because I threw the whole kitchen sink at it. You know, it was basically, basically me just venting and you know showcasing like everything what had happened but i realized i could thin it down and still get the message across do you have a do you got a new girlfriend i do have a new girl <laughs> yeah yeah she's amazing you purposefully left that girl out of the book kind huh? of the photo any photos of her huh? yeah yeah purposely 
yeah, and you yeah. had one and it was in there. Was that the one that was fogged up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was blurry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did it because I did it wasn't honestly, I was gonna leave her out of the book, but because the whole you know, obviously the accident happened because I was driving down to see her, like it was inevitable for me to, you know, leave her out, especially when she was the motive for me to get better, you know, as I was recovering. Um, because I didn't want to share that part of my life, you know. Who wants to say, hey, uh, you know. I got heartbroken, you know, no, nobody wants to say that, but I figured it was, it was a important aspect of my story. And I wanted also to share with everybody that I literally was broken down in every sense of the way, you know? So um, the last part that was still intact was my heart at that point. But after that, it was only <laughs> picking up the pieces and binding them together with love, patience, and resilience. I want to ask you a real quick question on uh, going back to the brain injury thing. What was that like for you? I mean, you had kind of described it in the book, but uh, you were you kind of in a dream world? Was that? It was more or less the dream world that I had been that day of the accident. So it wasn't that I I, I wasn't present in in reality, you know, or in today, but it was just like everything revolved around my girlfriend. You know, like I was going down to see her that day. And she was the one thing of my life from the past, from my past life that was still there. You know, I knew all my my dreams had shattered. I knew my life had changed completely, but somehow she was still there. So I was like, I'm getting better for her. And so my mind just kept replaying, kept replaying the same thing. Um, and that's literally how it was. And I kept getting migraines because my brain was still hemorrhaging. Um, so there was a lot of blood that my body had to absorb. And only when that happened, did the brain, I mean, did the headache stop happening? And then I could actually think clearly and my emotions were my, much more stable. And then uh, COVID hit, right? COVID hit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, how was that whole experience for you? It was, uh, it didn't change anything for me because, like I said, I was isolating. I was, <laughs> I was social distancing before it was in fashion <laughs> at that time, you know? So it, it didn't change anything for me. Like I woke up, went, did my therapy. Uh, I tried to work out. Then I went, read some books, worked on my portfolio. My days never changed. Um, and the only thing that did affect me was having to put my surgeries, uh, that most of them were qualified as elective surgeries, like the facial reconstruction, the, all the other procedures, um, just because the hospital beds were getting booked and full with you know COVID patients and so uh rather than be angry I, I was just uh thankful and grateful that I was still alive you know and if my bed could be better used for somebody who was battling for their life then by all means I would be patient and just keep working working out and pushing on with my recovery yeah I, I keep thinking on the I want to go back to a second too like with your support you know with your family and stuff and I, I correlate this a little bit with you know substance abuse and people that are in recovery, you know, you obviously had your family, you know, that was there would do anything for you. I, yeah. I pretty much saw. Um, and, you know, and then we kind of look at this, you know, in the world of recovery, um, you know, with substance abuse. And that's something a lot of people don't have, you know, is, is that support, but it's something that we always push for. And of course there's the 12 step programs and, you know, these, these other people that they can find. And sometimes we do find those people in recovery that they'll do anything for you. Yeah. I think that's one of the greatest messages in your book to, that we don't have to do this alone. Yeah. Now, aside from your parents, um, you had, you have sisters, one sister, two sisters. Yeah. I have two sisters and, and they both uh, helped me throughout my recovery process. Um, my older sister left to go to San Diego after I got discharged from the hospital um and she had a baby and named them after me um just because everybody had been afraid you know that they were going to lose me and i'm the only uh the only guy in the family besides my dad so i was the only the baby in the family so <laughs> it, it definitely almost tore the family apart uh but we're we're still holding strong now you were born in el salvador in el salvador okay and then how old were you when you came when you came over I was three when my family brought me here. Okay. Spanish, your first language then? Yeah, Spanish is my first language. So then you got to learn uh, English. 
English, yeah. <laughs> was it hard? Was English hard? No, it was easy uh, for me and my sisters just because we, we came at a young age. Yeah, yeah. For my parents, it was a lot more difficult. And uh, even in high school, though, I was going to take Spanish because it would be an easy A, but my mom never let us. She was like, I brought you guys here for, you know, for the opportunities and for education. So you guys are going to take French. So that's why I took French. And, uh, <laughs> do you speak it fluently? My sister and I, well, my sister speaks it a lot more than I do. I, I speak it, but she speaks it better. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and you still got all that, even with all your brain injury, huh? Yeah, that, that was the surprising thing. And I think uh, that's why everybody's just amazed, you know, how well I recovered um, just after that, those huge impacts and all the injuries I sustained. Um, my brain is 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, even, you know, before we got on here, I mean, you look great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See those photos uh, and, and the way you they did a really good job. And those were the the what do you call it the most PG version that I could find. Like all the other ones are really intense. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, we'll save those for later. It's amazing, man. You you're definitely that story of Unbreakable. Most people don't survive that. Yeah. <laughs> so every day is a blessing to me, and it's. I, I, it's even hard for me to believe it, you know, even though I went through it. Right. But like when I go back and see all the videos, the pictures, even even when I read the book again, you know, it's it, it's tough looking at it and realizing, wow, I really did go through all of that. But thankfully, uh, I'm on the other side of it now. And hopefully I can help others, uh, you know, go through their darkest moments and at least try to find that line that for me, I kept chasing this whole time. One of the lines I say in my book is no matter where you've been or what you've done, you can do anything you want if you're willing to fight for it. Absolutely. I believe that. <laughs> yeah. Do you go out and uh, do any speaking engagements? Yeah, I have four lined up for this month and early September. Um, I'm actually doing one with Mothers Against Drunk Driving uh, later in Monday of next week. Those first responders, how was it to be able to meet them? I mean, it's it was surreal in the sense that Again, these were people I didn't know. They were complete strangers to me that night. Um, the same as the drunk driver. Like I had no idea who he was and he, uh, he changed my life completely. But then these people, these uh, strangers, you know, gave me my life back. So it, it felt amazing being in the room with them and just being able to shake their hand and letting them see me walk in to basically show them what, miracle they produced it was it was i can't even put it in words like how surreal it was for me it's obviously we can't change our past mm -hmm. but what we can do is we can transform our past <laughs> i kind of want to ask you on this but this is sort of the way i look at it with myself is i did a lot of bad things you know and through my addiction i was a methamphetamine addict um got arrested four times in six months in 2001 i was looking at 15 years in prison that's where I ultimately started changing my life was in custody. That was actually at the point in time where I felt more freedom than I'd felt in years when I was in custody. Um, it showed me that freedom was actually inside, not anything from external. Yeah. And I look at my past, you know, there's nothing that I've ever done that makes me who I am. That's not me. I'm the one that did those things, but that's not me. But I can look at my past and I can say, you know what? My past helped shape me. And I love who I am today. I love who I am today. I wanted to ask you on that. And this is a tough question. Do you think this whole situation's made you a better person? I see how it could be a tough question. Because if I were to say it has, then it would be kind of like saying, oh, well, the accident was a good thing, right? But in my whole book, like even at the end, I'm always like, if I could change the past, I would. Because the person who I was before is the same person I am now, you know? This is my perspective on life has changed in a way that I'm a more appreciative of the little things. Right. But again, I wasn't ever doing anything wrong. Like I've never done, I've always tried to be a light in the darkness. So this accident again, should have never happened, but um, because I was probably one of the only ones that could take it, you know, at the time I, I would rather me take it than some little kid, you know? So um, I, I'm okay with it. And with that, now I take full responsibility of getting myself where I want to be. And it, thankfully nothing inside me changed. So yeah. 
I'm all better for it, I guess. Do you think one thing changed though, is that you're actually now you want to reach out and help people? No, I think that part of me was still there, you know, like I've always wanted to help people. I always wanted to, uh, you know, try to get the full potential out of everybody. And thankfully that still stayed after the accident. Cause again, I went through dark moments where I could have gone the opposite direction, you know, like it, would be, it, it was two complete different spectrums and more obvious. It couldn't have been as when I went to go see the drunk driver that hit me. Right. He was from El Salvador same place I was from, you know, my height, he walked in orange jumpsuit. It was like looking in the mirror. Uh, He was a little bit older, but I was like, we both made decisions, you know, that took our paths in lives different ways. So we were on opposite spectrums. Right. Um, So I could have done what he did, drown my, my sorrow and pain. I mean, in, in liquor or alcohol, but I didn't. Um, So I realized that everybody does have a decision to make and, Mine was that, hey, no, I'm going to stick it out and fight it out. And I'm still going to help people, uh, hopefully with my story and just keep pushing forward. So that's cool. I I like that, that, you know, you were you are who you were back then. Mm -hmm. You're still the same person for people out there that are suffering. What would you tell them? I would tell them to hold on for one more day, um, you know, and keep this is what helped me the most. um, And I think it's one of the biggest uh, I guess points in my story is focus on what you can control, you know, like put all your energy on what you can control, what you can't control, you know, put it out of your mind. Like it'll, it'll come when it comes. But for me, like, especially when COVID hit, like, obviously I had all these surgeries pending. I had to put them off. I couldn't control that, but the things that I could control was, all right, strengthening my leg, strengthening my brain, you know, like focusing on, getting my portfolio uh, beefed up. And so I focus on those things and that kind of put my intention on that, help keep the negative thoughts away. And so the time went by a little bit faster. And for me, the things I couldn't control, they eventually did happen. So all I did was hold on for one more day. I was like, today, it's okay. I'm still alive. Tomorrow, I'm gonna keep working on what I can control. And then what eventually, what I can't control will happen. Uh, so you just got to hold on for one more day and just work on what you can't control. One day at a time, right? One day at a time. <laughs> That's definitely the 12 step motto, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one day at a time. That's where that serenity prayer comes in, right? Yeah. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Yep, Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it was hard, you know, not being able to change everything you wanted at once, especially me going through all these surgeries. Uh, but I focused on what I could control, and that literally did give me some peace of mind, at least for those days while I had to keep pushing forward and keep holding on, uh, waiting that tomorrow they'll call me and be like, hey, your surgery, we're good to go. But if not, at least I kept improving, even little by little, I kept improving. As I say with the brain, you know, the brain is like any other muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where that book probably helped you, right? Yeah. No, it, it it did wonders. Did you learn a lot about yourself by doing it too? It wasn't so much learning about myself. It was more about kind of putting the pieces together of my life. Um, just because I was out for uh, that. I still don't remember like three or three weeks after the accident. So it was just kind of like putting pieces together and kind of realizing, Hey, this is my life, you know, like putting it down on paper and realizing I can't change that. But now I understand like kind of like the chronological events and realizing, Hey, I got from here. Now I'm here. Let's get here. You know, let's push forward and get to a new place where I want to be. And and you're getting there, right? Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you worried about your career when all this happened too? Did you think it yeah. was, gonna, did you think it was going to fall apart or? Yeah, but I think that was uh, out of my mind probably for the first several months just because of my brain injury. Uh, but afterwards, after I started realizing what had happened, really analyzing the magnitude of the events, then I started freaking out. And I started realizing that, hey, my life was completely changed. And is it ever going to be the same? Who knows? You know, only I could decide it. Or if not, I could make it better. So that's what I chose. And that's where I'm heading now. 
Back in it. Back in the swing of things. Back in the swing. <laughs> hey, is there anything I, I haven't brought up that uh, you want to say? The only other thing I would say, I guess the point of my book and the message that I wanted to get across, um, I really just wanted to help people get through their darkest moments. You know, for me, the darkness lasted for four years. Um, but every darkness, I mean, every night has to end. So you just got to hold on for one more day. And throughout my writing process, I was going to edit it and edit it because I'm a perfectionist, you know, like I really like things to be how I want them and almost perfect. So I was going to keep editing it. Um, but then I realized that my writing does get a lot better. The best writing is at the very end of the book. Um, and that's because throughout the whole writing process, my brain injury was healing. So I was going to re-edit it, but then I wanted the reader to go through that journey with me. You know, I felt like it would just bring them in a little bit more. So I decided to leave it as is. And I'm pretty proud with how it turned out. Um, yeah. Just kind of taking the reader along the journey with me through acceptance, you know, through the sorrow, through the ups and downs, and finally to finding some peace and joy. Yeah, like I said, I didn't get an opportunity to read the whole thing, but it definitely grabbed me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the, the story is, and, and I think the way you wrote it was magnificent. Thank you. So, yeah, I want to, again, everybody uh, check out his book, um, Chase the Light, The Gruesome Art of Becoming Unbreakable. And you can it can be found on Amazon. Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Nobles, online right now. It's uh, going to be physically in hard copies in brick and mortar stores, you know, like Barnes and Nobles and Books a Million uh, later next month. But right now it's just uh, online that you can get it. Probably Amazon would probably be the easiest way, honestly. Yeah. Amazon is always the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> For everything, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, very cool, man. Hey. I want to thank you again for coming on here and sharing your story. Powerful. And uh, and you're just proof that we can get through anything. The human spirit, right? Yeah. It's all about that. And uh, no, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm glad I get to share my story with the world, you know, and just help others continue pushing forward and just hold on for another day. I had recently uh, done a show with him on Hot Topics on Johnny Rock and Roll Radio. You can catch that episode on johnnyrockandrollradio.org under past episodes. It will also be posted on highwallclean.org. And he sent me a little snippet of a song because he's going to be putting out an EP soon. And so here is a song called Chase the Memories. Hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. And as I always like to say, keep getting high, but let's do it clean. We'll see you soon. Chase away the memories, I'll drink to your goodbye I swear I'll put this bottle down, but tonight it's running dry And it won't stop the pain And what we had is gone The music, it won't fade Somehow does I'm letting go I'm letting go